What's cracking, yo? Welcome back to Boo TV. Appreciate you for stopping in. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified, and let's get into the topic for today. You know, these days it's hard to get some of the greats to um, come on camera and, and talk. A lot of these guys like to enjoy their personal lives, and trust me, I get it. <laughs> I get it. But... There's a Michael Jordan interview that's been circling for a couple years, and I've seen small bits and segments, not much, and I wanted a chance to sit down and watch the whole interview, right? It's a um, uncut video of Marvin R. Shankin's back and forth discussion with Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Whenever Michael Jordan gives an interview, it's like a gem to me because you don't get a lot of them. And I always love to hear what Michael Jordan has to say to certain questions and topics. All right. This is about an hour long. Letting you know it's about an hour long. And the YouTube video itself that you're watching will probably be longer than that as long as I interject, you know, pause to interject intro and outro so you're probably looking at an hour and 15 minutes ish all right sit back relax if you smoke get a cigar because they'll be smoking some cigars in this video all right actually how do you like me now right here with your mic I don't know how to smoke a cigar, and I don't smoke cigars. I picked this thing up from a liquor store a couple months ago because it looked cool. And I was like, ah, this is cool. I'll just sit it on my table. Anyway, let's get into it. A message from Marvin. Just about everybody knows Michael Jordan, the athlete. A few people know Michael Jordan, the man. In 2017, I sat down with Mike for a wide range of interview that became the basis for our 25th anniversary cover story of Cigar Aficionado. We spoke about his career, his father, what it takes to win, his love for golf, cigars, the basketball draft, Cuba, and much more. Highlights have been posted and will have received more than 2.4 million views, our most popular video ever. They don't tell the whole story. The complete uncut video of the interviewer has never been seen until now. If you've seen the last dance documentary on ESPN, Netflix, or ABC about Michael's time to show the rules, there he was serious with a win at any, any cost attitude, showing us why he's known as uh, one of the world's most successful athletes. And this one of kind of interview, we find a down to earth guy like you and me. We have serious moments, but we also laugh a lot throughout the talk, enjoy one of life's greatest pleasures hand rolled cigars. Sit back and enjoy an inside look at one of the world's most fascinating people. My best, Marvin. Editor and publisher, Cigar Aficionado. I'm digging this music. Now I want to go to like a jazz concert or something. Am I holding this wrong? I guess I'm holding like a... How do you hold a cigar? Is it like this? It's like... You got it like this. Michael. Wow. Hate you. I'm over here like this. I've had it 30 years. Oh, I want you to have it. Wow. We're gonna smoke one of those. And that we gotta get some. Uh, <laughs> we gotta get some alcohol. <laughs> I about, about to say he about to ask for some. So let's else. start with this, yeah. and then we'll. This one is like drinking burgundy wine. Yeah, you got it's it. It's got elegant, it. but. These are yours. Thank you very much. And I also, the cigar you had, I brought you a box with oh, cigars here, so you have three. You gotta so, take care of me. Well, you know what? You're taking care of me. I mean, I told you I would. Yeah. So, I, part of this is to bring back memories, because you were smoking those cigars. I'm gonna go back to 93. Huh? I'm old, I can't remember what happened in 93, but I'll do my best. I just know we won. <laughs> That's all I remember. And I quit. <laughs> That's I all I need to remember. Right. <laughs> Mike, you better be careful what you say nowadays. They, they'll take you just saying you quit. Literally, like, 
You heard that? Michael Jordan's a quitter. People these days. Mm. And the draw is like perfect. Okay. My man Amar Rashad is going to die. Shout out to Amar Rashad. He's going to die. Well, if you decide you want to give him one. I, I'm only I, giving him well, one. You know, then. Uh, he likes these too. And I signed both boxes as Thank a you, memento. I, I may not give him one of these though. Oh, yeah. You ready? Mm-mm. I'm ready when you are. Okay. 20, 30 years ago, uh, millions of boys growing up wanted to be just like Mike. <laughs> when you were growing up, who did you look up to? Who did you want to be? Um, well, I was closer to watching my father do most of the stuff. So, I mean, I wasn't really into uh, professional sports because where I grew up, you only had like uh, two television stations. You know, uh, NBC and ABC. And we couldn't even get NBA games. So my mo- most of my focus stayed on the college game. So I was a big college basketball player. Mm-hmm. You know, I watched college and then baseball. Obviously, uh, my father was a big baseball fan. He loved Roberto Clemente. So uh, he was a, base- a Pittsburgh Steeler fan. Um, and I kind of grew up em- emulating... Uh, or following his footsteps in terms of who he admired is who I watched. Um, I grew up also a NASCAR fan. So I was a Richard Petty fan. I used to, we used to go, my father used to take the whole family, pack us all in, you know, this, this Chrysler, Plymouth, and we would drive all over North Carolina, South, South Carolina, and go watch stock car racing. So I was more into stock car racing than I was into anything else. Okay. So in late 2015, yeah. uh, and I'm sure you know of this, but the Harris Poll surveyed Americans to rank the most popular athletes in American history. <laughs> and you were voted number one. Babe Ruth was number two. Muhammad Ali was number three. And then there were a bunch of others, many of whom you know. All of this is wonderful. In your life, what is your greatest regret? Oh. You know, I I really don't have regrets. I am a person that says, you know, as soon as you look back in your history and you come up with something that you feel like you want to change, Mm -hmm. something else has to change. You know, so what about your biggest disappointment? Once again, that's the same same analogy. You know, disappointment to me to win, you got to lose. Mm-hmm. To be successful, you got to have something that's not successful. Uh, to be happy, you got to have disappointment. So, I think all of those things have evolved and happened to make me who I am and understand the benefits and the privileges I have for being who I am, you know, um, and not to wear it on my sleeve, be very humble about it. That's one thing my parents taught me very well is, you know, don't wear your reputation, don't wear your accolades, don't wear your, you know, your personality on your sleeve. Let it happen, let it be you. It is who you are, don't hide from it, but don't, you know, don't wear it and rub it in people's faces. So. You know, when you sit there and you say, well, you know, in 1990 or 2005, they voted me as like the best or the most popular athlete. You know, it's ironic that I'm the youngest of the three. So in essence, it's it's all relevated on who is watching now. Uh, If you ask 20 years from now, I'm pretty sure LeBron may beat me, you know, uh, based on who's going to be making the voting. So I take I say that to say to understand that, you know, it is what it is. You know, I don't wear it. I don't showcase it. I don't rub it in other people's faces. It's someone else's opinion. If you ask me, I can never give you an opinion about things like that because as an athlete, all you want to do is be the best athlete you can be. Well, well, on that point, when we did the interview 12 years ago, you made a big point that you wanted it to be private, that you wanted to take back your life, that you had been yeah, in sure. the public eye and so forth and uh, so forth. Now, um, he mentioned LeBron. Jordan and LeBron couldn't be 
any more of, po of polar opposites. Their mentality is completely different. Whereas Mike doesn't care about the stuff and doesn't care to give his opinion on things like that. You know, he mentioned be the best player I can be. LeBron's a total opposite. He cares about all this stuff. He cares about the attention. He wants people to look at him a certain way. He values the attention and the adoration. I'm cut like Kobe and Mike. I'm from that cloth. I'll be jumping around, but I have this burning question <laughs> that I think you're in a very unique position to answer. All right. Um, college kids can't wait to leave school to go into the pros. Um, there's no real rule that you have to be 21 or that you have to finish four years. You have and to I, be 19. I, I, I'm just saying that, but in no. other words, at, at age 19, when you're yeah. still a very young man, you give up your education, you give up the college experience and so forth and so on. And upon reflection, I know that you're going to say that some people for financial reasons need to, but, sure. but what, what do you think is is really um, the correct, the right way for the NCAA to, or the NBA to handle this? Well, you know, I've been on both sides, obviously. You know, I left school at the age of 20 and 21, uh, my junior season. Uh, it wasn't a financial decision. It was more or less a, you know, a business decision, an opportunity for me to play professional basketball. I was, you know, so close to graduation, so education still was a part of everything that I do or I did at the time. Uh, my feelings about, you know, a kid being able to go to the pros, and I've seen both sides, is that you should allow a kid, if he feels like from a financial standpoint, that he wants to go and work and earn a living. I think there's a certain way that you can go about between the NCAA as well as the NBA and all parties involved that you can systematically build a way to where that kid now at the age of 18 or 19 if they want to go and play professional sports, they should be allowed to. Kind of like baseball. You know, baseball, I think, has a has a very good plan, you know, where if you come out and you get drafted at 18, you start in the minor league system and you work your way up mm -hmm. to where your skills determine if you are qualified to play on a certain level. Along with that becomes a compensated aspect of what, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to be compensated based on your skill set at that mm -hmm. particular time which I think is very correct. So I think from, from a basketball standpoint, and if, you, if you're 18 and you choose not to go to the pros mm -hmm. and you go to college, I think you're, you should be obligated to stay in college for a length of time to where you can educate yourself, you focus on education, you focus on your maturity, focus on your development of your bodies and your mind, and then be allowed to come into the NBA, not the CBA. So <clears throat> I think to me that's, that is a perfect model to where everybody gets exactly what they deserve or what they need. All right, so, so what's in this young man's head? Is it about getting the best deal he can or is it playing in the city that he wants to, and there is his hometown or is the city not an issue? It's what are the, what are the criteria upon which they hope they get drafted by a certain team? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I think that's a little bit hard to determine because you in, in a professional league of multiple teams, you know, when I say a league, you want to be able to have competitive balance within the league. And if a player or an individual can choose based on the city to go to whatever respective mm -hmm. team that he wants, mm -hmm. you may have, you know, you, you're going to have some uh, discrepancy in terms of the talent pool and mm -hmm. the competitive nature of it. So if everybody wants to go to Chicago, mm -hmm. You only can have 12 jobs in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Chicago is going to get all the best players. What about mm -hmm. Dallas? What about Washington? What mm -hmm. about these other cities? Detroit, mm -hmm. you know, Indiana, where they may not be, they may not be metropolis of cities, mm -hmm. but they still have passion for the game of basketball. And you, you're starting to see a little bit of it now to where all the mm -hmm. you know, stars are starting to gang up and go on one team. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's going to hurt the overall aspect of the league from a competitive standpoint. And you're going to have just one or two teams that's going to be great, and then the other 28 teams are going to be garbage. Or they're going to have a tough time surviving in the business environment. So, so what role, positive or negative, does... Yes, there aren't as many super teams as there were 
since the decision started and post Kevin Durant, Golden State Warriors, there aren't as many. Well, I, even back then, there was only a few. But like Mike said, it wasn't competitive. We knew the Cavaliers, super team of Kevin Love, Kyrie Irving, LeBron James, was going to meet the Warriors in the finals. There, there, was, there was no... What's the word I'm looking for? I'm not... Anyway, y'all know the word I'm looking for. There's no parody. There's no parody. We all knew it was going to happen. It kind of sucked. I like it now, man. It's, com it's more competitive. And you really don't know what team you really... It's hard to pick a... Uh, you know, the two teams that are going to be in the finals now. As an agent play in helping the young man make the best decisions. Well... Uh, I give you a good example, you know, and and, and because and I asked you that because you're not only a, no, no, a player, because but you're I was an on, owner. I was on the same side. Yeah, yeah I was on the other side. Yeah. And now yeah. I'm on this side, yeah. and I think where the agents' responsibilities are is to educate the individuals, educate the kids to be mm -hmm. able to make sound decisions from where the way they sit or what mm -hmm. they think they want. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times you have the a agents making decisions based on what they want as opposed to what the players want, and sometimes it's not even in the best interest of the players. It right. may be in the best interest of the agents. That's, you know, I think if you can regulate that, which is very tough, mm -hmm. if you can moderate that to where that player or that athlete is going to be educated about his mm -hmm. positions, that he can make sound decisions that's mm -hmm. going to be best suited for him and his family, mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's the correct agenda. You know, mm -hmm. my agent, when I came out of college, I had a, you know, obviously I was in college for three years, Coach Smith, my parents taught me, you know, the right from wrong, taught me to understand and listen and learn. And then I got with an agent that basically educated me about the positions that I was in, how to, you know, mm -hmm. to manage my own, you know, my personalities, you know, the business aspect, how that translates mm -hmm. into, you know, in the business world, things of that nature. To a point now, I can do a lot of those things on my own. It's an education. You know, I lived an education. I went through an education based on, mm -hmm. you know, how my life was, you know, was, was, was lived. I think that can be very helpful for the kids today, you know, but because the agent is, is not, that motivated or not that's that's not their energy mm -hmm. they're not teaching the kids you know and the kids then by the time they're not useful to the agent mm -hmm. now have nothing no decision making knowledge mm -hmm. you know they, a lot of times they may end up mm -hmm. broke you know they mismanage their money you know you can avoid some of those problems especially mm -hmm. when you talk about the kids are skipping college and going to the pros mm -hmm. where they're gonna get that education from you know the best and the, the mm -hmm. best support system they have is the agent. Mm -hmm. So if the agent's not going to educate them, you tell me they're going to learn, you know, the pros and cons about being independent and being able to manage their own finances. Mm -hmm. So when they are not mm -hmm. represented by that agent or they're mm -hmm. out of the game of basketball, out of the game of football, mm -hmm. can they still articulate and make decisions just, you know, from a business mm -hmm. sense? I, th um, I get where Mike is coming from. Now, I correct me if I'm wrong. I I think the league NBA has programs in place for rookies coming in, and uh, you know, for like financial education, economics 101, you know, living alone, all all these things that you need to learn in life that will be valuable as you step into this role. Uh, this this new position where you're surrounded by men in a whole new lifestyle and they try to teach you the principles that will help you survive and have a long career, especially managing your money. You know, things like that. And um, so I, I don't know how good these programs are that the NBA has that I think they have. How long do they last for? Can you stay in this program for years? Is it just like a four week course, you get a certificate and they kick you out. I don't know the quality of these courses. I don't. But also I know kids, kids, I know people that went through college, got all this stuff, got credits for it, and they still out here making poor decisions. So is it something that you can, can it help in some cases? Yes. Is it guaranteed to prevent? No, but I mean, you hope for the best, right? I think that's that's one of the major issues. You know, you, you see a lot of players who, you know, when they retire, they have no money. You know, they have mismanaged their money. They have in, in all sports, in all the sports, life, the lifestyle, football, the lifestyle, baseball, whatever. So you talked earlier. You mentioned about 
uh, the competition between cities, and it's a, sort of a dual question. You can go wherever you want with it, but you know, you now are, are the owner of Charlotte. Right. Um, I assume you're at a competitive disadvantage uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and also the audiences at uh, who watch uh, basketball are declining over the years. I think it peaked when you were playing. Right. Um, some people say there are just too many teams and the talent pool is diluted and uh, the economics really favor the bigger cities in, sure. a, in a large way. Uh, I'm sure you're, you didn't buy the, the Charlotte team to be an also win. You want to you wanna win sure. the big prize. Sure. Do you have a shot? How, ca how can you develop your team to become a winner? Well, being I think, from Charlotte. Yeah, well, it takes a lot of work, you know, which I'm not afraid of. It takes a lot of, you know, uh, forwardly thinking, seeing good talent, nurturing new talent, developing new talent. One of the biggest issues we do have is we're not a Chicago, we're not a LA. So you have to create a culture, you know, that a winning culture, and you gotta be able to connect that basketball team to the support system within that community. One of the biggest reasons why I bought the team initially, well, I felt the team was under, under uh, preserved, uh, you know, under operated because they were not connected to the, the community. Charlotte led the league for 10 years. When they first came into the league, led the league in attendance for 10 years which was wow. a huge economical you know, support for that city. And the talent pool followed that. They had good teams that went to the Eastern Conference Finals. You know, they won 50 games. They had potentials of winning. And they got lost in the transition. When, when Charlotte moved to New Orleans, Charlotte was without a team. Then you had an owner come in who was not from North Carolina, did not understand, you know, and we're good friends. Bob Johnson and I are very good friends. And we talk about this and we understand the difference in terms of how things has transpired mm -hmm. since I've taken ownership and since he was on. Um, that disconnected itself from the mm -hmm. community, um, angered the community to where they would not support. Mm -hmm. uh, the talent pool was not quite the same. It took a transition in terms of the kids were getting younger and younger mm -hmm. in drafts. And what that in, uh, entailed was you didn't have the same talent that when we played, the talent pool was much broader because the kids were in college much longer and they and coaches could develop them. Their skill set could develop, blah, blah, blah. So as the, the rules and the more players started to buy a forego college and go to the NBA, what eroded was the talent pool as well and the education of basketball. One of the advantages you have is that in the 300 mile radius, you have so many colleges that have great teams. Oh, great. Sure. Do you, do you, are you active in recruiting? Uh, to some degree, yeah, I am. I try to, you know, it's, it's a very sensitive thing to recruit. Um, you well, know, you so. certainly go to games and see the talent. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I go see the talent. But yeah. in terms of recruiting a kid to go to North Carolina, yeah. that's a very personal and family decision. You know, maybe North Carolina doesn't best suit that kid. Maybe. No, I'm talking about once they're in college. Once they're in college, it's not a recruitment anymore. It's a, it's a draft. Yeah, but you can decide who it is you think. Well, right. You, you can evaluate it, but if you got the ninth pick, you got to yeah. have eight other teams pass yeah. on that, that particular yeah. player. So you're yeah. going to have to understand what may fall back at you at nine. You know, so we have a good department that has, we put so much emphasis because as you see, the star players are not rushing to small markets. So your, your selection of the talent mm -hmm. has to be a little bit more um, uh, worked at mm -hmm. and selected, uh, selective for mm -hmm. your team and your culture and for the city and, mm -hmm. and from a coaching standpoint as well as from an organizational standpoint. So I put more emphasis on draft mm -hmm. than what I used to because... Is this fool falling asleep? <laughs> Is he falling <laughs> I could tell how his eyes are blinking. That, that is the look when you are tired as hell and trying not to fall asleep. 
and trying to keep them eyes open. I think this fool falling asleep. <laughs> I'm probably wrong, but that is the vibe I got. You're not being able, you're not going to be able to get, you know, the bronze of the world to come to Charlotte. You didn't wake up or when you were playing for the Bulls. He looks I'm sleepy. sure it was not on your mind that your dream is one day to own a team. But I'd like to know when, when the light shined on you that this is something I want to do. And what was it that motivated you to, uh, to own a team? Because nobody, no player's ever done that before. Well, <laughs> I always wanted to be connected to, ba to basketball because my love is always going to be towards basketball. And the best way that I think I can pass on the knowledge that I have for the game of basketball to, to tomorrow's players is through ownership. You know, being able to, you know, to earn the respect of the players, be able to communicate with the players, to, to give them the understanding of what it takes to play in the league and to excel within the league. So when initially when I got out of basketball uh, in 2003, uh, actually I got out in 1998, you know, when the team was dismantled, um, I really didn't know what I was gonna do in terms of ownership. So I looked at, and I, I was presented an opportunity to be a part of a ownership in Washington from a general manager standpoint. And, right. and with that came an education of understanding what it took. So quite naturally, you're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna understand you're gonna make mm -hmm. mistakes. The, the, most, the, the most important things about making mistakes mm -hmm. is being able learn to learn from, from them and not be able to duplicate the same mistake. Right. So when I got the opportunity to be a part of the uh, Washington Wizards at the time, um, and Ted Leonsis brought me in as a part of his group. That's where I got my feet wet in terms of ownership and it was intriguing enough i didn't have the you know the experience of ownership i knew what it took which was a lot of money a lot of financial support mm -hmm. but the knowledge in terms of being able to transition from a basketball player who could impact a game and de determine the outcome to where now you sit up in a you know in an office and have not the same control you have to, you know, you have to be able to live vicariously through the players that you select, which sometimes, you know, you're going to be allowed, you're going to make mistakes. And with that mistakes, you got to, you know, be able to make adjustments. And that's what I learned in Washington. And, you know, in my first couple of years, I was a general manager. Then the next couple of years, I went, went down and I played because I still felt I can impact the game from a player standpoint. Not with the same magnitude of what happened in Chicago, but from a teaching standpoint, mm -hmm. saying that, okay, a lot of these kids, they believe in, in leadership from a physical sense, where that I can show you how hard it takes to work. You know, I'm in the gym, the first one in the gym, the last one to leave, blah, blah, blah. And I felt, I felt like I can pass that to okay. the players. So that's where the Washington experience Okay, happened. so what I'm hearing you say is that your your first and greatest passion is basketball. Yes, N at that time, yes. Okay, now we're fast forwarding all these years to today and you are a very um, complete businessman. Sure. With many different interests. Do you have a favorite amongst your businesses? Do you spend more time in one than the, I mean, you have, in addition to the, the team, I can go on and on. I mean, the list right. is pages, but you know, your Jordan shoe brand, uh, I'm told does $3 billion a year. That ain't hay. <laughs> but it's a it was a process with that as well. I mean, and it, it's it's dots being connected. You know, it's basketball, something that you know when the shoes were at its peak. You know, I played at a high level, and and the consumer saw that, and it basically authenticated everything about that shoe. Shoe, yeah. What we've been able to maintain is being able to communicate to the consumer from a basketball from an ownership standpoint their preference for that product. 
Do you spend a lot of time? I spend a lot. Business? I spend most of my, if you talk about, if you look at all my portfolio of mm -hmm. things that I'm involved in, my strongest passion outside of the ownership of the Hornets is the Jordan brand. Because to me, I can impact that in a much greater sense uh, to be able to con con continually talk to that consumer, interact with that consumer. It's not a draft. It's not, you know, it's not where I'm, you know, dependent on how the season ends to determine if I have a draft pick in the first of, first 12 or 13 picks. So if I had to pick of all the you know things that I'm involved in, the most important is the Jordan brand because it is my DNA. It is who I am. The Hornets is a product of the personnel that I assemble. And if it doesn't have that DNA, you may not get the same results. So it's a work in progress with the Hornets. With, the, with Mike, are you are you calling out your worker bees? <laughs> they ain't got your DNA. That's what's going on in Buzz City, Mike. That's what's going on in Buzz City. <laughs> Listen, I, I did think the Hornets were going to be good this year if the Miles Bridges situation didn't happen. That that was a severe shot in the heart for the team. They lost Miles Bridges, and then Lamelo Ball has been hurt a lot. Started the season off hurt. And that's why the team got off to a bad start. And he was in and out after that. Uh, so it's been a, some bad luck there in Buzz City. I, I will say that. With the Jordan brand, it is successful because I can impact it. Mm -hmm. Or that, you know, how often do you see the symbol of the brand, an icon, that can communicate and say what, you know, what I think or and, impact that product. And it truly is global. Yes, it's true. It's true. So having the Hornets and having the, the shoe, I understand. I don't know anything about it, but you have car dealerships. True. Why do you not just the shoe, but the Jordan brand? Right. You got that logo on T-shirts, jogging pants, shorts, basketball shorts, all kinds of gear. What was that? Was that just? An it was an opportunity presented yeah. to me uh, mm -hmm. early on. Uh, that uh, from a friend of mine in, in Wilmington, North Carolina, he owned car dealerships. He came to me and says, well, you know, I got this opportunity to get involved in a car dealership. Would you have an interest? That was purely from a business sense. Okay. What about the restaurants? Same exact thing. But you've had Ooh. restaurants for a while, and now apparently recently you've been increasing and opening new restaurants. Real quick, has anybody ever ate at one of Jordan's restaurants? I have not. The only athlete restaurant I've ever ate in was Shaq's. That's it. Uh, what's because of the success of it, the the, the uh, cornerstone guys who yeah. have have uh, basically you know I partner up with, they help and they manage the the, the restaurant scenarios, mm -hmm. and what we have been able to is to understand what works with the consumer once again, and we've been able to grow that business. So initially, you know, when I was coming out of college or when I was in the NBA early on. Would I would have said that I would have been a restaurant owner? Mm -hmm. No. Once that was presented to me and I understood the dynamics of you know that business, we were able to grow that, utilizing my persona in a whole different way, tied into restaurants and you know obviously. Was there something about being in the restaurant business that fascinated you personally? I love food. Just, I, I mean, know. I like food. Obviously, I love you know gatherings. I love mm -hmm. plus you know having somewhere to go. Yeah. Where I can control the environment, yeah. it's always intriguing for me, because I can let my hair down, what little hair I have, yeah. and be able to do the things I want to do. My restaurants allow me to do that. You know, I can go in, I can get a good meal, I can bring friends, I can talk, I can drink, I can do whatever I choose to do, and not worry about repercussions from that. You know, uh, so it's a, it's a safe haven for me, and yet at the same time, it's it's a great I business. Never, I never thought about and it like I, that, and I, and I assume that you have no problem getting a table. No. Not that I know of. <laughs> Not that I know of. Um, we talked 12 years ago about, you know, your love for cigars. And then also you said you were you you enjoyed wine. Sure. Has that experience of wine, because you sell wine in your restaurants, right. but at home, are you, are you a, 
a drinker? Are you a collector? What? Uh, I'm a drinker. I do collect, <laughs> but uh, you know, I don't believe in collecting and not being able to enjoy. You know, what so, kinds of wines do you drink at home? I'm into Burgundy's, Pinots right now, um, and I got the education of wine from a, you know Bill Gelato, you know, who is a good friend of mine. Mm-hmm. You know, and we spend time talking about it. Uh, at one point in time, we were thinking about doing a wine together. Mm-hmm. Uh, it never materialized, or I never got to a point where. I could devote the time to doing something because you can always put your name on something. Sure. But, you know, most of the things that I do, practically all the things I do, is very authentic, authentic, authentic. in my involvement. I don't right. want to just um, lend my name to a product because at the end of the day, that product is always going to represent my DNA. So I like to have some interest and I like to have some input. I like to have some participation. Uh, it's nothing that you that doesn't go out with my name on it that we don't oversee you we don't you know we don't deal with so it's man that, that's good to hear that is because i feel like there's a probably i mean i i don't have any way to prove this but i've always felt like you know a lot of guys in similar positions just have people doing it and you know people that they trust being approvers and they're just sending this stuff out and this guy really has no idea really any good idea what's 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 going out as far as products, but he just knows that his name is on it and he's gonna get paid. But I, I like to hear that, man. That's that's cool. I didn't know that. I didn't know his level of involvement was that much, and he felt that uh, he felt this way about it that he wanted his DNA imposed on his products. He wanted his touch on it. There's a certain feel of authenticity there. It's it's a process. It's something I have a strong interest. My wife loves it. Um, we have countless number of bottles of wine you know we do tastings uh no difference in cigars i collect cigars as you know um, well we're gonna get to the sky let's digress to this golf i mean every it seems like anytime <laughs> i'm at the bears club you're out there wheeling around in your golf cart with a cigar in your mouth i don't i smoke six cigars a day maybe do you play golf almost Ooh, every day almost every day and sometimes 36 holes. Always 36 holes. And what's your handicap these days? Four. And it's a bad. Six cigars a day? Dude, I I, I tried smoking one once, bro. I, could, I, I couldn't get past a couple puffs, man. Six cigars a day? I mean, his lungs are built. Like, we all knew Mike smoked cigars for years, but six all day? Bad for so don't yeah, I don't, heard, don't think that you no, can take heard, advantage. No, of I heard it was a two. It's a, so no, I mean, I'm just, it's a four. Uh, well, um, <laughs> you're friends with a lot of the young pros. I'm just curious because a lot of us. Uh, I'm going to mention a few that I know you know, All right. and I'd like you to give me an idea of how good you think they are and what you think their potential are because these are guys that I'm He's pretty sure say you know ball. very well. Sure. Uh, let's start with uh, a new neighbor soon rory very uh, talented uh never played golf with him yet oh i guess is he just talking about golf athletes rory mcelroy i'm assuming we'll see really i've seen him on the range we have talked um i'm a big fan uh for someone that small mm-hmm. and generate that much power um it's truly amazing i'm fascinated with my massive size mm-hmm. and some of these guys being so small and it can blow it past me, which is somewhat frustrating, but it is what it is. I mean, you know, I'm pretty, Ricky is coming into his own, real talented. Uh, he's actually just starting to get over the hump of being, uh, I think where I read, and this is not what my interpretation was, he was the most overrated golfer, I think, that I saw. And I thought that was not fair. Uh, I felt like he is a... He's a phenomenon in the sense that he's, he resonates with the consumers and with the kids. And I think he had some jealousies in that, in that approach and in, in the way people viewed him. Uh, but, you know, and I had some, you know, I can have some correlation to that, you know. Have you ever played with Jordan? Sweet. No, I actually did. I just played with him a couple, uh, about four weeks ago in Cabo. Great kid, um, very, very polite, very talented, grinder. Um, when you get, if you got a guy that's 
you know, that's not talented, mm -hmm. but yet he has heart, he has determination. You know, he finds a will to win. Mm -hmm. That's Jordan. He doesn't hit it long. He's a great putter. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he's got a lot of attributes, and I think a lot of it comes from, you know, just his hard work. Justin? Talented. I met him when he was mm -hmm. 12 years old. Do you play with any of these guys? Play or? with them all. I play with them all here. Uh, I do all I can to to get their competitive nature. Okay. So who am I? Who am I missing that is in this young collective group of of? I play with Brooks stuff. Kepka, uh, yeah, uh, who's who's young and up and coming. Yeah. I play with Jamie Lovemark, who was you know NCAA yeah. um, winner. Keegan Bradley, I you know obviously yeah. he wears the Jordan shoes. Uh, Luke Donald is like. Mm -hmm. A senior um, friend of mine who teaches me more things about the game from a uh, from a mental and from a short game standpoint mm -hmm. that I spend probably most of my time with because he's two whole, two two doors down from my house and his wife and my wife are very close friends. Um, I know that you have been over the years very close with Tiger. Tiger, sure. Where do you see him in terms of his life? This is a transitional period, you know, um, and we, we athletes, we go through that, you know, and then we have to be adults. We got to make, you know, sound decisions, you know, we got to make quality Our decisions. decisions. Um, he is to me in a very unique situation. You know, Tiger played and at his peak, you know, somewhere towards the end of mine at the, you know, to, of my career. And then what changed between that time frame to now, social media, Twitter, you know, all those types of things that has mm -hmm. you know, invaded, invaded the personality and the personal times of individuals to a point where, you know, people have been able to, you know, uh, utilize it to, to financial gains, things of that nature. And, you know, for someone like myself, mm -hmm. you know, and this is what Tiger deals with, is that I don't know if I could, you know, survive in this Twitter comment, in this Twitter time, mm -hmm. where you don't have the privacy that you would want, and what seems to be very innocent could be always being mis misinterpreted. You know, in the conversation of uh, five ten, yes, people were, will interpret it how they want to. They will see things how they want to see it. And they never take a, a step back to say, hold up, maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way. Is there another way this can be interpreted? Let me look at it. Let me look at everything. Nowadays, they, they don't, people don't even want to do that because they, they want to put out that. They want to put out the comment they want to put out. They know what they're doing. Ten years ago, it was always, who's greater? Who's going to be the greatest, him or Jack? And that conversation is pretty much over to most people. Uh, uh, I, I, I beg the different, and I, mm -hmm. I'll give a different analogy to that because, first of all, you're, you're never going to say who's the greatest of all time to me. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's more for PR and more for selling mm -hmm. stories and, and getting hype. Uh, Jack and, and Tiger never played against each other. They never played in the same tournament. They never played with the same equipment. They never played with the same, you know, length of golf course. I never played against Will Chamberlain. I never played against, you know, Jerry West. To now say that you know one's greater than the other is being a little bit, you know, unfair. You know, uh, I think when you can see the similarities and you understand, you can, this is one way you can judge the two. How much impact did each change or or evolve the game? Jack during his time when he played, or Tiger during his time. Now you know, obviously Jack won more during the time he played, Tiger evolved it to where it was, you know, it crossed a lot of different boundaries where it's not just a white guy's sport, you know, the black guys, Afro-American, you know, all the, the minorities play the game. Mm -hmm. And you play it at a level to where mm -hmm. it generated so much interest financially that it grew the game from a financial standpoint. Now, does that constitute him being the greatest? Or does that mean he's any less than, than Jack? I think it's unfair. Yeah, Jack probably has, he has 18 more majors, uh, 18 majors, and Tiger's got 14. And I think those are when, you know, that's how people are judging certain mm -hmm. things. I won six championships. Bill Russell won 11. Mm -hmm. Does that make Bill Russell better than me and make me better than him? No, because we play at different eras. 
So when you try to equate who's the greatest of all time, it's an unfair parallel. It's an unfair choice. And I think, you know, those are the demons that, you know, obviously Tiger had to live with, and he's going to be challenged, and he's going to be graded upon that. Mm -hmm. But for me, mm -hmm. I think they're both great. I would never say one is greater than the other. That's me. That's my opinion. Okay. I, I wasn't suggesting one was. I was just asking your thoughts. Yeah, well, that, that's my thoughts. Uh, moving from uh, basketball to Derek Jeter, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't he stay with you? Yeah. I mean, because I saw him one day. He's like my little brother. brother. Yeah, and I said, where are you staying? He said, I'm staying with Michael. No, he so, hangs out. We hang out a lot. We and then a, a few weeks ago, I saw your name mentioned as an investor in the Marlins. So what motivate is it strictly friendship or a business or both? Or I mean, you love baseball. I or? love baseball. My love for baseball. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not final. Obviously, yeah. they got to go through approval state, mm -hmm. state of mm -hmm. uh, his ownership. And you know, when he came to me about getting involved, I said, look, I would support you in whatever way. I have my own businesses. I have the Hornets. I have, you know, the Jordan brand. Mm -hmm. I would support you in whatever way you want me to support you. Uh, I think he's motivated to build a baseball franchise that can be successful. That is who he is. That's the way he lived his life. It's, it's very resemblant. It, it, re, it resembles everything that I tried to do from a basketball sense. He's trying to do from a baseball sense. I can only congratulate. I can only support. I think he's going to do a great job. I think he's going to, you know, he's going to roll up his sleeves. He's going to dive in. He's going to try to do the best that he can in terms of reconnecting it back to the city of Miami and blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know how I can, you know, be a part of it, but I am a part from afar and, and from a support standpoint. Well, in some ways. But I love the game of baseball. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Right. And I, in some ways, you now are on almost identical paths as yeah. owners with a, a team that needs to step up its game. Yes. And the thing that I can provide for him is for my team, you know, uh, to be able to lend him advice and, and give him some insights in terms of what we did in Charlotte, you know, and to reconnect and to turn things around to where it's a more successful franchise. You talk about teaching. Have you ever been a coach? No. Did you ever want to be a coach? No. I have no patience for coaching. You know, my biggest problem from a competitive standpoint is the, the focus of today's athlete and the focus of where I saw the game, how I pursued the game. It changes and it's, and it's totally different. So to me, for, I, to, for me to ask an individual, Right. To focus on the game the way I played the game it's in unfair. some ways would be, you know, unfair for that mm -hmm. kid to have to endure that. And if he didn't do it, <laughs> no telling where my emotions would be. I don't think I would have <laughs> the patience for it. So in essence, coaching is something that I've never really felt I could do. For Kobe Bryant more or less said the same thing. He said, I got the patience. He said, he, he said the same thing when somebody asked Kobe about coaching. But he ended up coaching for his daughter's team. But kids are different from an emotional standpoint because I'm much different and I have a different perception about things than what the kids do today. Because it's a cigar magazine and because I'm trying to reach out to what my reader would want to know about you, I'm sure they would all like to know, you said you smoke six cigars a day. Sure. What do you smoke? What are your favorite? My cigars? favorite? Yeah. Particus Lusitanius is my favorite. Uh, and that's so you like a big cigar. I like a big cigar, but I, I don't, you know, I can smoke a small cigar too. You know, um, I like variety. I like to you know, at least experiment uh, on different types of uh, levels in terms of cigars. Why don't we go this one? It's it's you know this is. I'm not uh, giving this up. You want to try something else? Then, no, you know? I I, I want to go the pre. Okay, I go just with it because mm -hmm. it draws a little. But nothing wrong with this draw. No, it's just that you got me talking so much. I can't f smoke the cigar. Well, I, I want to apologize. <laughs> okay, no problem. I don't want to leave without having this cigar. So, and I, don't I was want hoping you, you forget. You no, know, and I don't want more you, for me. I don't want you taking home the box. And I, you know, I don't open these that often. 
my voice. So I got to get my swig on. Oh, this is going to be great. This is the best part about this whole process. Is the cigars that you had to come up with. These are your cigars. I don't know. Oh, shit. <laughs> this is a pre-Castro Cuban. Um, I can't wait. Ooh, I'm dizzy. To Have you ever been to Cuba? Many times. That was That's where we were headed next, so... Yeah. So I got this one. I'm smoking it. Actually, I, I started going there in 1991 to do a cover story for the Wine Spectator yeah. on Cuban scars. I had no idea when I went there I was going to have a cigar magazine. Then I went to Cuba, and it's like I didn't want to die with having. Well, that's my that's my magazine. that's my dream trip. But, well, here's so I'm, I have a quote here from our last interview 12 years ago. And it's this quote, my biggest dream is to visit Cuba and visit some of the cigar factories. Yes. Obviously, with the embargo, it's a little difficult. Yes. Well, you can go now. I could. Um, I want to go with no restraints, though. If I go right now, you still have restraints, you know, politically as well as, you know, a lot of other things. You know, my, my wife is Cuban. Mm -hmm. You know, her family has got a lot of memories about Cuba. So in essence, uh, she wants to go, um, which I think is a motivational factor because she wants to go for different reasons. I want to go for particular reasons, obviously. <laughs> so in terms of us being able to go, it's coming. It's just a matter of time. I know. Well, I'm going. I, I can. Uh, I'm going to tell you something you already know. I know you're going to take me. You can take no, me. no, I wasn't going to say I'm going to take you yeah, because you I don't want to be surrounded by thousands and thousands of people uh, following me around as you would. I don't want to either. <laughs> but you would be so unbelievably welcome in Cuba from the Cuban people and the Cuban government. It would have an enormous impact on how they felt about their own self-esteem. Really? Yes. I never looked at it that way. And um, I, I mean, I looked at it from a selfish yeah. stand, in standpoint in terms that I think it's a, you know, it's a very uh, rich country. Um, I, I, it, when I say rich in terms of, you know, the things heritage, that I like, yeah. you know, heritage right. and things mm -hmm. of that nature. Right, right. It, it, traditional, you know, I, I initially, and one of the things that my father-in-law and I talk about all the time is that I wish I could buy one of those old cars and ship it back here. Because you know, to me, that's... Yeah. That's very authentic to be able to see something like that. And to be able to go and see how this transformation happens, because I'm such a fan of cigars. Well, if you, uh, I don't want to get into too much. I've been there many times. But if you went in a cigar factory, all cigar making would How Mike's father-in-law got to be about the same age as Michael. That's probably how they, could, they mesh so well. Because I'm pretty sure his wife is in her 30s stop and they would give you a welcome that would give you goosebumps but i don't want them to stop i want uh, to see what they do well they'll they'll then they'll, then okay. you ask them to okay. continue and they'll continue <laughs> but um or that's my, that's my dream you. that's my dream trip okay so that have you been ever to, to a cigar factory anywhere else in any of the other caribbean countries or no never have you are recognized in the business press i hate to even use the word i apologize for using the word a billionaire. Me? Yeah. What does that mean? What does it mean? I don't think it changes anything. <laughs> I mean, um, other than that, people can call me uh, and ask me for money, maybe. Yeah. Respect. Know, got no, but I mean, on, on one level, um, you started out as a... <laughs> it's not in those kids from North Carolina with Dean Smith. Sure, I got an afro back there. You see that? But, right? but if your dad were alive, um, he'd be so proud of you. What would my father do right now? First of all, he'd probably be sitting and smoking a cigar and asking, <laughs> answering. He some looked of just like his pa too. too. He's a, he, you know, he's a very thoughtful guy. You know, the thing that I remember the most about my father, and you know, I had him for thirty-two years. You know, and I never look at it from a negative sense. Obviously, he was murdered, and you know, and. You know, rarely do I get the chance to talk about him, you know, but the thing that I do remember all the time, you know, I think about him practically every day, is for a person like myself who live in this in the spotlight and, and is so critical, you know, from people all the time, 
in terms of what I do, what I say, you know, where I go. The thing he's always said, take a pause before you make a decision and say, what if? And the purpose for saying what if is mm -hmm. that whatever decision you make, mm -hmm. always either going to have consequences, mm -hmm. either pros and cons. No, but you obviously listened to your father because in the very beginning, you spoke about being humble, not shouting about who you are and what you've done, and just being within yourself. True. And a lot of kids growing up may start that way because of their parents, but don't end up that way. Right. You ended up that way. Well, I mean, once again, I mean, mm -hmm. it's not just my father. You know, I, my mother calls me practically every day, reiterating, keep your nose clean. Like I said, him and old boy, they, they're completely different. Completely different. <laughs> completely different. That's her, that's her, she ends the conversation <laughs> of every time I hang up, as opposed to me, you know, hey, obviously we say, I love you, mom, can't wait to see you, talk to you soon, blah, blah, blah. The last word is just keep your nose clean. That's her constant reminder to say, hey, look, people are watching. You know, people are learning, people are paying attention. And, you know, the best news in today that sells it's negative news. It's negative news, yeah. That's controversy sells. I know. And not controversy sells. Sex sells. Those are those are like the two top sellers, man. Controversy and sex. That is true. That is true. That I, I live in a in a box to where I'm afraid to do things. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, as as my father says, the what if comment is to be able to deal with the consequences of what decisions you make. And you think about that, and if you think about the consequences, pro or con, mm -hmm. you make, the, you make the, the right decisions, that you feel is the right decision. Now, all the decisions I made, other people may view to be not Bad the right decisions, decisions from their perspective. But for me to go play baseball, and everybody says, oh, it was a, it was a failed opportunity to play baseball, you know, that's what they think. Mm -hmm. For me, it was the best thing that could have happened for me because it allowed me to go back to the game with a stronger passion. At the same time, I was mm -hmm. able to understand the love that these minor league baseball players have, mm -hmm. making $1,500 a month, $1,500 a month, which is nothing. But for them, it was big. Yeah. To me, to see that helped me put things in perspective to understand the platform that I was on in 93, that when I went back to it in 95 and 96, I appreciated it even greater. So when we won those championships and we went through those, those things mattered to me far greater than what I did in 91, 92, 93. People don't see that and people will never understand that to be success. You know, all they think about, well, he batted 202, you know, and he struck out a certain number of times. Yeah, okay. You know, but the effort was there, mm -hmm. and the learning curve and the passion was there that has transcended not just to me, mm -hmm. but to other people who are afraid to do things because they're worried about the perception that may come from other places. To me, that's more gratifying uh, than anything, you know. Um, so that's the things that my father and my mother instilled in me. Take a negative and turn it into a positive. Don't be afraid to fail. I know you're concentrating on the answers because it's a very serious conversation. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm telling you exactly the way I feel. My no, answers no, are, are no, what I No, I, I understand, fear. but, but I'm, <laughs> what I really want to ask you now is while you've been uh -huh. talking, you've been smoking a pre-Castro Cuban cigar. <laughs> And the learning curve hold on, hold on, let me go back. and the passion sure was I heard there that, right. that has transcended not just to me, mm -hmm. but to other people who are afraid to do things because they're worried about the perception that may come from other places. To me, that's more gratifying uh, than anything. You know? um, so that's the things that my father and my mother instilled in me. Take a negative and turn it into a positive. Don't be afraid to fail. I know you're concentrating on the answers, because it's a very serious conversation. No, I'm not. 
I'm, I'm telling you exactly the way I feel. My no, answers no, are, or no, what I, no, I, I understand. Feel. But, but I'm, what I really want to ask you now is, I don't know. I really don't know where he was trying to go with that. What, Mike? I'm just as confused as you. <laughs> he could. He couldn't even. He didn't even have a response. He just went into the next question. While you've been talking, you've been smoking a pre-Castro Cuban cigar, <laughs> and. How does it taste? Great. Is it unbelievable? Absolutely great. So. Oh, may maybe, okay, he was getting that. Hey, well, tell me what you think of that cigar. I know you've been talking a lot. Tell me what you think of that cigar. I, I think that's where he was going with that. Other than playing golf with me again and going to Cuba. That wasn't that, 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 was, that was really. Huh? Did I win? Did I win? No, no, you were at. You, Did I win? I'll tell you what happened. It's no, no, a, it's a no, yes or no question. It's a yes or no question. No, no, I got it. What happened was you insisted on playing for more money per hole than I wanted to play for by a large amount. It's not the money. Well, wait a second. We were down on, on I 18. I didn't say how much did I win. No, no. I said, we, did I win? We, we were, no, we were down <laughs> going into 18, and Billy said to me, don't worry. I'll take care of this hole, and we end up pushing. So to repeat the question, other than playing golf again with me, and other than going to Cuba, what's on your bucket list? The winning championship in uh, in Charlotte. Bravo. That to me is huge Bravo. because I think this. I don't know if that's happening. I heard some rumblings what a couple months ago uh, about Jordan selling the team or selling a certain amount of stake in the team. I don't know the details, but we'll see. City is uh, is deserves it. They've gone through a lot. Uh, me personally. Uh, like any father, I just want to see my kids successful. Uh, I haven't, I have endured, or I've gone through so much of good things. You know, there's very few bad things, but you know, bad things make you better. But uh, I don't need anything else to suffice my life. You know. Uh, so, what is this that has been written about, but not in any great detail? That there's a eight or ten part documentary coming out. Where you, where there's <laughs> many hours of film, I guess going back 20 or 30 years, and that there's something coming that is going to be very un unusual in terms of a person's life. Oh, I, I keep forgetting this, this inter the interview itself, the interview itself, not when they upload, the interview itself was pre COVID. So the last dance hadn't happened yet. I'm like, where? Ooh. What's going on? Can you yeah, talk you're, about you're, it? You're very knowledgeable about things that you're not supposed to be knowledgeable. You're not supposed about. to be knowledgeable. Ones. Yes, the, the one the the tapings of my last year or our last year, 1998, we had a camera following us the whole time to capture the last dance at that time because everybody felt like the team was going to get dismantled. And what you see, I think, in that is. Um, My dedication to the game of basketball, unwavering, unwaveringly, you know, dedication day in and day out. And how I hold being the leader of the team, being the one that's been there for the longest, I hold everybody else accountable for the success of what happened at the end of the year. And people may look at it and, you know, they're going to get a, an honest understanding for what winning is about, you know, what leadership is about. What passion, drive. Now you you know, players may look at it and say, "Well, God, it was it was really tough." But when you think about what happened after us winning, you know the contracts that you know the guys got, mm -hmm. the memories that everybody got, the championship, blah blah blah. It's much more gratifying. Is the that. documentary finished? Uh no, it's not finished. Have you seen a lot of it? Yeah, I've seen it. So it's had it been through an editing process. And so no, it has not gone through a true editing when process. When will we all be able to see? Uh, I think that's one of the things that we had determined. You know, one of you know my 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 agent and all my people that's been working with me along with the league has been pushing for me to do it. And and I just it's one of those things where you know there's a time. It's going to be a time where you you know you, you showcase it, and when you showcase it, people are going to understand you know what really happened, and, and they can put themselves in that position. Um, so interesting to hear him say that now in hindsight with the pandemic and the lockdown. And then he was like, this is the time. This is the time. 
hindsight. It's amazing. Looking at it from that perspective. You know, and, you know, I have no problems, you know, with people seeing that as long as they understand the passion because it's a strong passion for it. And, mm-hmm. um, and it's very raw. But it's going public. Eventually. Yeah, but I mean, I think eventually it will. I think it's a wonderful way to go public, to share with people what it was like. In you those sound, you sound like my, 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 my agent and, you know, my financial people, I'm all ava- the people. I'm available. Me. Yeah, I know. I'm sure. um, but I think it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's a true passion. Not, I think it gives a great example for if you love something and your, your, your agenda is to be successful and to, be, and to win, it's a certain price you have to pay and it's a certain accountability you have to hold. Okay, but here's where I'm going. <laughs> you, this is 20 years ago, represented values that you had that many athletes today don't even understand, right. let alone possess. So it could be a great learning experience and teaching experience for all these young people that think it's owed to them. If it's perceived properly, you know, once again, and I say that, you know, with the understanding that uh, this is a very critiquing period, you know, of, of, of this world to where, you know, your intent may be viewed and we're going to try to make sure the intent is, is portrayed in the right way. But that doesn't mean, you know, someone's not... I was about to say, that don't mean shit, Mike. And you know that. You, you're about to say that now. It don't matter how how much you try to gift a presentation or an idea, a product, they will always find a way to not receive it how it was supposed to be intended, no matter how much you try. So you know what? Just go, just, just don't even care anymore. You can't you can't dance around these social norms forever. I can interpret it totally opposite of what the intent may be, and then it's going to be up for scrutiny and up for conversation and criticizing and blah blah blah. I'm not worried about that. I know because, he's not worried you know, about at, it. Oh, at the end of the day, you know, my heart, and my, my my soul, my dedication is mm-hmm. is is in the right place. Right. So I, right now, have one regret. You? You know, I have a regret. It has to do with the cigars. This f***ing cigar Knew it. <laughs> is one of the greatest cigars I've ever smoked in my life. And I'm giving you the only You hate giving me that box. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, I figured that was something like that. You I mean, hate giving me that taste box. taste it. I mean, it's unbelievable. Come on, man. Everything comes with a price. You want to share with people that you actually care about. You know, in, in essence, that's what you're doing. You know, you know that I'm not just going to, you know, waste it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take... take Joy and you know that I'm gonna but smoke be, every uh, one of them. Don't give them to your friends. I'm not gonna give these they're, things. They're, believe they're not, me, I know how to. I, I can censor these types of situations. <laughs> I'm not gonna give, you know, guys who've never f- smoked a cigar, yeah. a 30 year old cigar that they can't appreciate. Well, 30. Forget about 30. Well, it's uh, for hell, it's 60 years or something. Okay, 60 how many years? years I mean, we're talking about. I got you. I got you covered. You you only got one though, and I'm not gonna give anybody. <laughs> I'm not going to smoke more than okay. more than one a day. All right, so to wrap it up, because I'm almost speechless, but I have a job to do, so I can't. Why do you do so few interviews? I mean, hardly any. And why have you agreed to? I was literally just, uh, then I said that in the beginning, I opened this thing up. You know Mike ain't doing a whole lot of interviews, so when you get one, pay attention, baby. Give us a second one. <laughs> you, haven't, you, haven't, you haven't figured that out? He, all you got to do is look at those two boxes over there. Yeah, but that, you, that, didn't, that was, you was, didn't know they were coming. Oh, uh, well, I yeah. told you the only way I was going to do it. You have to <laughs> dig in your fucking your humidor and give me something that's worthwhile. So uh, but, I, I laid the parameters but, early. But you trusted me. <laughs> I did. I trust you. I, I figured you would be honest. I, I don't mm-hmm. think you're going to do it. But uh, part of the reasons why I, I've, I've kind of toned back is I want my life to be my life. You know, I don't want to sit here and constantly reiterate things that – you know, I've said countless number of times, and right. uh, at the end of the day, my time, you know, my time in the, in, in the spotlight is is dwindling, and I I, I want to be able to control what I can, you know, what I do and what I don't want to do, and blah blah right. blah. No, no. Someone else needs to step into the light, limelight and, and and either enjoy it, you know, or prosper from it, or grow, or have people understand who they are, blah blah blah. Me, I I, I need no more admiration. You know, I, I've had enough, and it's been great. 
I'm still going to be a very positive, you know, uh, force within the community and, you know, within, you know, with the kids of tomorrow. But I got my own kids. I got my own wife. I mean, I'm 54, 54 years old, you know. I want to be able to, to go through a day, go now. through a week, not worrying about what I got to do Wednesday, what I got to do Thursday, what I got to do, because I never enjoy Monday. I want to be able to, you know, and sometimes I surprise the shit out of myself saying, look, I got nothing to do today. Oh, I got nothing to do tomorrow. I got nothing to do on Wednesday. That's to me is ultimately retirement. You know, that's where I want to be. And if I choose to get involved in things, then, then hey, you know, I want to go to Charlotte and I want to see what's happening with the team. Or I want to go to Portland, spend a week out in Portland, blah, blah, blah. But not to where, you know, my, my moment, the moment that I'm living right now, I'm worried about what I have to do tomorrow. And that's where my life was getting. All right, so I, I probably work too hard. So all I can say to you is I want to be like Mike. You can. Drink Gatorade, <laughs> shave your hair, get a suntan, you know, all the things, smoke a lot of cigars. Hangs, well, right? Hangs, right. hangs, wear hangs. You ever, ever, just to, I, I am dying to know, have you had any holes in one? Two. Where? At uh, Turnberry in Miami on number three and number seven. One, I hit a seven iron, one, I hit a five wood. Wow. I only had two. But, I mean, it was enough to keep me coming back. Hey, that was a dope interview. Like I said, I don't have a whole lot to say. I've, I've interjected, I paused and interjected and, and said my two piece. But, man, love, love hearing Mike talk, man. Great, great, great insight and just, you know, love hearing his opinion on things. And I tend to agree with him on a lot of things. He's he's, he's very well, um, not he's very well thought out, but um, his opinions are very well thought out and processed uh, that he gives. And um, it, it, it was awesome. I, like I said, I've seen tidbits of that. Now we're here. But I did mention controversy sells, right? I did mention that. Controversy sells. <sighs> Him and LeBron James are polar opposites, man. Here you got Mike. I, I ain't got, I, I'm done with it. Well, once you're older, LeBron might might feel the same way once he gets, you know, 55, 60 years old. And then Mike was done with it way before then. But um, just like he's like, I don't care about um, parading myself around. And I did this, I did that. He didn't say that verbatim, but that's basically what he was saying. And I was like, him and LeBron are polar opposites. LeBron's out here. Look at what I did. Look at what I did. Wearing shirts that say, check my stats. Uh, I've done this, this, and that. Nobody else has done that in the league. This is why I think I'm the GOAT. This is why I am the GOAT. Da, 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 da. And I'm just like, and he's so obsessed with getting that adoration and getting that recognition and wants everybody to believe his greatest of all time. And Mike, as you see here, and I'm glad he spoke on those points, he's the total opposite. Total opposites. He definitely ain't going to compare himself to players that played in different eras, like Mike might say. He definitely ain't doing that. And I'm glad he bought up his six his six championships to the plethora of championships that Bill Russell has. Won one of them things, man. Who am I to say I'm greater than Bill Russell? Jerry West. You know? Mike getting... You know, Wilt. Who am I to say I'm better than this guy or that guy? It's unfair. We like talking about it, right? Because it's a very, it's a fun topic to debate for some people uh, to think about. What if? What if that player played in this era? What if that player played in that era? Well, this era, this uh, superstar skill can definitely transcend his skill set. Definitely transcend. So let me go ahead, drop him in this era. Let's talk about it. This is how you would do, probably. Things like that. Yeah. That debate will never go away. Despite how nuanced it is, that debate will never go away. It will go on till the ends of times, till the aliens come down and blast us to smithereens, till the comet hits us, till Armageddon, whatever the case may be, whatever you believe is going to happen. But that debate is not going anywhere. But I love Michael Jordan's insight on it. I love his opinion on it. But they are they are complete and total opposites. 
and I, I like his take on fear. Uh, he basically said you can't let fear consume you. You can't let um, you can't be afraid to fail. Like that that Kobe shared the same sentiment. But I've heard other legends and superstars frequently say that you know they were afraid to fail in certain moments, and not say that they did fail or they let it get to them. And, and let that drive them the wrong way, but they admitted to having that fear when they seen certain players. It's a good cigar. Anyway, let me know what you think about it. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Remember, controversy sells, folks. Y'all start dropping all those controversial comments in the comment section. If you don't like what that guy says, let that guy know your opinion. <laughs> Let that person know your opinion, male or female. <sighs> Stir it up, baby. Grab a cigar. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified, and I'll catch you on the next one. We out, baby.